I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So in that meditation, you may have experienced a, a mingling, a blending of peacefulness and lovingness, calming, open-heartedness, a kind of warmth and ease together in the present. And that's a good foundation experientially for what I hope to talk with you about tonight, which is really one of the central themes in the whole Buddhist tradition found also in other wisdom traditions, different kinds. It's the combination of different words you might give to it. I used peacefulness and lovingness tonight, um, sometimes called wisdom and compassion. The wisdom that arises from peacefulness and also the wisdom that fosters peacefulness, including the wisdom that recognizes changing conditions that have um, a certain inherent lightness to them as an experience, even if the experience is quite painful. So I'm gonna stay with lovingness and peacefulness, um, compassion and equanimity, and I wanna explore with you how they fit together. Last week, I talked about equanimity fundamental um, quality to cultivate, highly valued in, in the Buddhist tradition, um, as basically a kind of spaciousness or a kind of fundamental inner shock absorber that can allow anything to pass through awareness without it invading and occupying you and disturbing you in the core of your being. And this is something to definitely cultivate over time. It's fairly easy to be equanimous when everything's going just fine, but maintaining an underlying deep inner peace, deep equanimity, when you're stuck in traffic, late for a meeting, trying to call them on your cell phone, and you're out of battery or something like that, or worse conditions. How do you maintain equanimity even then? Um, Alongside that equanimity, though, must be a fundamental warm-heartedness. Otherwise, equanimity can be apathetic or overly disengaged. I've known people who had a, you know, who were definitely engaged with meditative practice. They were so calm inside, you wanted to shake them <laughs> about certain things. Uh, and they were using their equanimity, their calm, as a kind of spiritual bypass, to use John Wellwood's phrase, bless his memory. Uh, and equanimity without a warm heartedness, a tender heartedness can become cold and indifferent. On the other hand, compassion, lovingness, kindness, commitment to justice can wear us out or lead us into excesses of fieriness that are problematic if we don't also balance it with a fundamental quality of equanimity. To bring it down to earth, and I've seen many examples of this coming through the chat, both for the pub, for public, publicly stated as well as private chats to me individually, what do we do when there are people in our lives that we love dearly, we care immensely about, and we cannot save or rescue or repair with or get them to talk with us ever again? Or what do we do when um, we care immensely about suffering in the world, and yet there's so much of it, we have very little power to change? How do we hold those two together? And how do we actually uh, draw upon our capacity for peacefulness and equanimity in a way that serves the opening of the heart? so that we're not so overwhelmed and flooded, traumatized even, by the suffering we open to. How do we combine those? Really, really fundamental matter. 
Last week, I spoke a fair amount about the nature of equanimity, including its neurological basis, and you might want to go back and take a look at that talk. Uh, I won't say much more about it right here. I do want to say a little bit about compassion, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the combination of the two, and then open it up for discussion and questions. I'll look at questions and comments coming in through the chat and hopefully be able to speak with at least a few of you directly back and forth. So compassion. Compassion has, you could basically think of it as these four elements to it and four aspects. And this is my way of sorting out compassion. There are different ways of doing it scientifically. First, compassion recognizes suffering. Compassion is grounded in suffering or the recognition of suffering. It's a response to suffering. Kindness, lovingness, friendliness may include a recognition of suffering, but not necessarily. Compassion necessarily is a response to suffering. So there's a recognition of suffering. That recognition could be merely conceptual, merely cognitive, we just know it as a fact. Uh, it could also be really quite empathic in, in which there's an emotional and a somatic, empathic uh, dimension to the recognition of suffering. That's the first element of compassion. And in my view, it's a necessary element. There must be that recognition, often with a somatic and emotional, um, empathic empathy in it as well. Second, empathy is neutral. Compassion involves benevolence. We care about the suffering. We're not indifferent to it. We're certainly not callous toward it, and we're definitely not cruel toward it. There's a benevolent response, a caring response that's supportive, tender, sympathetic, uh, some kind of um, positive response to the person who is suffering, not merely shrugging and dismissing them and moving on, a second element. Third element of a kind of comforting or soothing, if, if we can offer it, or a helpfulness uh, in, the, in the moment to relieve the suffering. So we have the recognition of suffering, benevolence toward it, and a movement to relieve it in the person who's experiencing it. Okay? And then fourth, there can also be um, an understanding of the causes of that person's suffering and a movement, a, a motivation, maybe an action to change those causes as well. In other words, suppose you um, you see a person, you have a friend, who just came back from an appointment with their doctor, and your friend has a medical condition they're worried about, so you recognize their suffering, number one. Number two, you have a caring, a benevolent response to it. You care about them. And let's say third, when they came back from that that meeting with their doctor, they, they were frustrated. They did not get their questions answered. It, it was upsetting for them. Uh, they felt disrespected. Maybe they felt patronized, like they were patted on the head and then sent on their way. Um, and in you is then um, a sympathetic reaction to your friend. You talk about it with them. You're, you're comforting about it. You, you ally with them in what happened. You go, yeah. You, you try to understand it, you know, but then you, you realize, yeah, they were mistreated. And you, you stick up for your friend, maybe. You know, you're, you're like, uh, you're loyal to them. You're, you're, <laughs> you're annoyed on their behalf. And whatever it is, in this third category, there's the direct relieving of your friend's um, suffering to the extent you can do it. That, to the extent that it's appropriate and skillful. Uh, maybe your best response to relieve their suffering is simply being a very sympathetic listener without getting into fixing things. And then potentially fourth, if you find out, for example, that uh, they've never been very happy with that particular doctor, 
uh, you might start exploring with them how they could get a second opinion, maybe how you could help them find another doctor or drive them to a different appointment or even help them to think about in the complex healthcare landscape, um, certainly in America these days, uh, finding you know a different provider. You would be a, you would be focused on changing the causes of their suffering. You see these different aspects. It's important to appreciate that much of the time, the third and the fourth elements are not possible. Uh, I was um, listening to some people from New Zealand recently talking about flooding there, recent flooding in New Zealand, and I could feel immediately a sympathetic response, a compassionate response to those people 10,000 miles from me or whatever in California. But meanwhile, there was nothing I could do to relieve their immediate suffering, and I, I wasn't moved to do anything in the moment, nor could I, you know, was I moved in the moment to change some of the causes of that flooding, maybe linked, uh, statistically at least, to, you know, global warming. Um, but still, the compassionate response was real. Similarly, we can have a kind of compassionate response to ourselves in which we recognize our suffering empathically and we're benevolent toward ourselves about it. We're not dismissive to ourselves or cruel to ourselves. Um, and there's nothing we can really do about it. You know, maybe we're dealing with uh, chronic pain and it the pain is the pain. We can't relieve the pain in ourselves and we can't change the causes of it, which might be in the past in a car accident we were in 30 years ago. Um, but still the compassion for ourselves is real. I'm just calling out these distinctions to heighten mindfulness of compassion and to kind of broaden the space in which we can consider compassion. There is a lot of research these days on the benefits of compassion and self-compassion. Uh, I'll share with you just four fundamental headlines. Much good research shows that the experiences and expressions of compassion increase physiological regulation of the body lowering stress reactivity, lowering perception of pain, uh, the sense of pain, and helping the body be on more of an even keel. That's pretty good. Second, compassion reduces psychological distress and dysfunction. It tends to lower anxiety. It tends to lower depressed mood. Um, it tends to buffer us against trauma. It's helpful in reducing negative, uh, you know, psychological factors. And third, compassion is really good in promoting positive psychological factors, a sense of worth, a sense of, uh, with self-compassion, a, a kind of willingness to try things because you're not so vulnerable to self-criticism, um, you know, boosting your mood in general. Compassion's a good thing. And fourth benefit has to do with prosocial factors, being able to, uh, to be more motivated to be cooperative and helpful to others, uh, you know, recognizing um, and feeling more keenly that others matter and letting them land. There's so much about modern life that can numb us to other people. Um, there's so many TV shows that are just casual in their brutality. Uh, lately, I've been exploring uh, and looking for themes of compassion in uh, movies and television and, and literature and fiction. And it's startling how rare it is often to, um, to, to find expressions of compassion. Maybe the, the fiction or the TV or the movie elicits compassion in us for the characters, but do we see them expressing much compassion for each other? Not that much, often. And so one thing that compassion does in this age of media saturation in which we're just bombarded um, is to keep the heart open, to keep it sensitive and vulnerable so that we actually let other people land. Okay. And then compassion and equanimity together. Uh, they support each other, first of all. Uh, equanimity gives us that underlying emotional stability that enables us to really open our hearts to others and not be overwhelmed by it so that we have to withdraw. Flowing the other way, compassion 
gives us a wider sense of the world and our relatedness with other beings, which naturally then draws us into regulating ourselves and being calmer, less driven by our appetites, and less driven by forms of craving that ripple out to increase the suffering of others, including based on how much we consume in our consumer culture. Compassion and equanimity support each other. Experientially, in our intimate relationships, boy, <laughs> my journey over the last few years has a lot been about the intersection of compassion and equanimity, uh, both prodding myself you know, to be uh, to widen the sphere of compassion for others and what I take into account, and not just indulging in a kind of pleasurable inner peace. On the other side of it, especially, boy, oh boy, oh boy, uh, equanimity has really helped me uh, not be so disturbed by and, and overwhelmed by the growing you know, sphere of compassion, including for people that you know, I care an awful lot about. And that's been a very important intersection for me over the past year, and it's, it's one that I think is a very important one for us to explore. One way into it, as I move now into being a little practical uh, on the way to opening it up for discussion and your particular questions, um, is to engage a meditative practice that's very interesting, like we explored tonight, uh, in which we mingle, we rest in, you know, a loving peacefulness, um, a calm friendliness, you know, however you want to frame it. And it, the different words open up to different nuances in this experience. And to take that experience as your object of meditation, even as a concentration practice, so that you can become increasingly absorbed and with a sort of singleness of mind in a traditional term, increasingly absorbed in this intersection, this combination of lovingness and peacefulness in a way that increasingly borrowing from you know, traditional language in the, in the early teachings of the Buddha, um, it's as if your whole body becomes increasingly saturated with a very luscious, absorbing, almost thick feeling of peacefulness and lovingness together that is increasingly enjoyable. And recognizing the, the sukha in Pali, the sweetness, the happiness in the feeling, the mingling of uh, lovingness and peacefulness actually increases the neuroplastic registration of that experience into your own body, into your nervous system, so it becomes increasingly trait-like in you, this, this mingling of lovingness and peacefulness through becoming absorbed in it as a meditation. That's a, that's a skillful thing to do. Second is to uh, remind yourself, when you're really rested in a sense, let's say, of caring for someone and, and worrying about them maybe and feeling sad for them and sad about them, perhaps, you know, you're, you're really open in, in your compassion. You've, you've swung strongly, let's say, into compassion. Uh, at that point, it could be helpful to kind of remind yourself a little about equanimity. Can there be an underlying spaciousness or, or, or a all-encompassing spaciousness in which the compassion is occurring. You're not trying to dial the compassion down. You're widening the field of your consciousness you're experiencing in which the compassion is occurring. On the other side of it, if you're rolling along and feeling really pretty good, you know, you've turned up the piso stat on your inner peace. You're really, you're really rocking that channel. Yeah. <laughs> inner peace, inner peace. Yeah, you know, tranquility's really working for you. 
you've swung pretty far that way, pretty calm, pretty settled. You know, you're, you're recognizing the emptiness of all phenomena, calm. At that point, you might want to ask yourself, is there a place for uh, widening the heart, opening the heart, tenderizing the heart? Uh, I was once sharing uh, my kind of state of practice with my friend and teacher, Tara Brock, maybe a year and a half or, or more ago. And I was telling her just how my practice was going. It's a useful thing to do with people. And she said, oh, really good, Rick, really good. What do you think about moistening the emptiness? <laughs> Moisten the emptiness, right? Because I, I had swung pretty far. I had pretty well-established, you know, real-time sense of the emptiness of experiential phenomena. Uh, not that they don't exist. They just exist emptily. And there was a real calm and peacefulness there. But it was fairly cool. The emptiness, that, that sense was cool. And she talked about warming it and moistening it. It was a little dry. So that might be a second thing for you. When you swing one way, become aware of the other to balance yourself. And then um, I would just say last, one thing that's also really helpful to do is to pit, is to pit, is to pick a particular person or situation. Maybe it's a work situation doesn't have to be involving another person. Maybe it's some project you're engaged with, something you're working on. Maybe it's a household thing. And ask yourself, can I approach this task, this pile of emails maybe, this load of dishes, huh, this mess left here by my roommate or my partner? Huh. What would it be like to deliberately call upon and at, you know and, and open up to, to as one, as you can just in, in real life right in the minute right in the moment mm. to call up a combination of of a kind of underlying peacefulness underlying spaciousness and a fundamental kindness a kind of good-heartedness that sort of leans in you know, I had a spiritual teacher quite a while ago who had the phrase, grace leans. It's that quality of that kind of, you know, leaning toward, leaning in to life and objects and other people with a benevolence in you as you engage them deliberately. You could think about doing that deliberately with a particular situation or a particular person or a particular interaction. Okay, lovingness, peacefulness, compassion, equanimity, the jewel and the lotus, the lotus and the jewel together. Remembering the saying that no mud, no lotus. <laughs> so in that context then, I'll take a look at the questions or comments that have come in uh, through the chat. And if you care to speak with me, uh, I see, Lynn, you have your hand raised, I think. Good. Uh, you might want to just use the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, if you has a smiley face uh, icon, if you click that, you'll see an option to raise your hand. That'll move you to the front of the gallery. Um, and if you do have a question, please, for the sake of all of us, including me, uh, make it succinct and clear and specific, including to what we've been talking about tonight. Uh, let me just speak to two things that have come through very briefly. The first is what to do with the common occurrence, maybe even tonight, that you feel like you're really kind of far along, like you've really cleared something or you've stabilized in a good place, and then whoop, you're back again. Uh, well, that's really common and no big deal. And in a weird way to look at it is thank you. Thank you, trigger. That has reactivated me because it's giving me an opportunity now that this material has been reactivated to clear it out one level further, one step further. Because we cannot clear out material that's currently un unconscious. If it's out of awareness right now, we can't clear it. So in a weird way, you can thank the things that trigger you, which does not mean look for 
things to trigger you because there are enough triggers in life already. But we can be kind of thankful that we got plugged in. We got reactivated. Oh, because now there's an opportunity to practice with whatever has been surfaced, to be mindful of it, to be spacious around it, to develop insight into it, to uh, actively release it and to actively replace it with something that's beneficial, wholesome, enjoyable, and positive. So that's one way to relate to that. Second, uh, someone was commenting that, um, you know, there there are teachings in early Buddhism um, that really extol the monastic life over the life of a householder. They're there. That's how the Buddha taught. He was a monastic. He was teaching mainly to monastics. Uh, and, and he was encouraging in the culture of Northern India 2,500 years ago what he had done himself, if you can, to go forth into homelessness, as it were. Um, it's not the only way to practice, and it's not even the only way to be enlightened. And there were significant householders in his time who became fully awakened. Um, and certainly in many parts of the world today, many lay people, including myself, including my central teachers, who are deep in practice, um, who are living a householder life and taking advantage of the stuff that comes up in, let's say, a marriage or a sexual um, aspect to your existence or just the daily issues of living a householder life, making good use of them for your own practice. You don't have to be a monastic. That said, you know, making that the entire focus of your life can really have a lot of benefit, whether you do that for a few months or a few years, uh, or maybe make a choice. And uh, I may be making that choice myself as I get older and older to have that aspect of life really begin to predominate, uh, even without formal vows as a monastic in various traditions, to make more and more room for that in perhaps the later stages of your life, you know, can have a, can have a real beneficial impact. Uh, but it's not that there's a big should about it. And sometimes we don't have those choices. We're, we're involved in a certain kind of a life, and we have a lot of momentum in it, a lot of karmas in it, and that's where we're, that's where we're practicing. And the life that we have is full of opportunities. Uh, you might like the book Knee Deep in Grace, it's a series of stories about Deepa Ma, D-I-P-A, new word Ma, uh, who is known essentially a saint um, in modern times from India, a teacher of people like Jack Kornfield and Joseph Goldstein, Sharon Salzberg, and others, um, who is known as the mother, Deepa, of Ma. You know, So she was very embedded in her role as a mother and a grandmother and living a, a layperson's life um, you know, with tremendous awakening and spiritual powers, uh, and full of lovely stories, knee deep in grace. And as she said to people who would tell her, because they had very, very busy and committed lives as a person living in poverty while raising a family in, in urban India or rural India, um, they would say, I have no time for meditation. And they kind of didn't. But she would say to them, well, do you walk? You know, when you move, when you take care of your home and your children, do you walk? And well, while you're walking, you can be meditating, <laughs> walking meditation. So, you know, she was basically saying, even in the midst of any circumstances, you can still practice. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see, I'll leave that there. And so Lynn, I'm gonna ask you to unmute, Lynn Harbaugh, and hi there. You have to unmute yourself, there you go, great. Hi, Rick. Great. <laughs> So my question is this, uh, you talked about movement to benevolence um, and you also talked about replacing behaviors intentionally. Yeah. yeah. Um, my question is, could that surface as humor? And I will sure. give you an example. Um, I'm from a background where we were treated really poorly, especially verbally abused. Mm. Uh, every, but everyone was. It wasn't just my sister and myself, but anyone that we encountered was treated the same by one member of my family, my, yeah. my mom. And um, so I've been aware for a long time how I'm just so judgmental of other people. I don't like the way they look. I think they're this. I think they're that. I'm also aware that it's an echo from my past and not sure what to do about it. 
So consciously, just in the last two months, or maybe even two weeks, this idea came to mind that when I would do that with someone and see someone on the street that I was judging, I would just say to myself, that person has something to teach me. Ah, oh, very, yeah, I see what you're doing there. So what's the question? So the question is that that has sort of evolved into, <laughs> I'll give you the example. I'm I'll make this fast because there's other folks. I was at the laundromat, the downtown laundromat, a lot of street folks come in and, and do their laundry. So I'm doing my laundry and there's this, only one other person two aisles over, street guy, looks rough, scares me. He looks really rough. And, and then I think he's got something to teach me. Yeah. I let it, and then it turned into humor because he says to the attendant, it's not working. I keep putting the dimes in. And I said, but you have to look at it a certain way. And, he's, and he just ignores me. And she says, oh, I'll fix it. And I said, but it doesn't like red clothes. You can't put red clothes in it. You're kidding. Now I understand. I think you're, if I could jump in, Lynn, you know, because I'm, I'm still searching for the question here, but no worries. Um, you the know, question was, can it surface as humor? Yeah, yeah. Particularly given the fact that you came from an environment where people maybe were caustic and cutting, and there's a way that humor can be cutting. So I, I think you're right. I think of the Dalai Lama, actually, as someone who uses humor quite well to uh, make a point, but in a way that's gentle. And I guess deep down, if I could, I'm really glad you you did bring this up. And and there is that there's a great question in what you're saying, which is to really look at intent. I can notice that I might say something that's kind of jokey, but in my mind is a little bit of topspin that expresses my exasperation with them or my scoring of a point. And being mindful of that little bit of toxicity mingling in the humor, even if it's not revealed, can be really helpful. Yeah, and at other times though, if you look closely, and sometimes I think it's helpful to kind of do a little quick review cycle, uh, because humor can be also, what's sincerely uh, loving on your side can be, can rub another person the wrong way, you know? Humor is pretty tricky. Um, but there could be that fundamental sense of, uh, I think of a fellow a fellowness when when we make fun of ourselves, you know, then I think the humor lands better. Anyway, I'll just leave it there. I'm going to think okay. more about that. But Lynn, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep. Can I just going. finish it? Nope. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. Sorry about It has about a great. That. It has a great ending. I hope it did. Okay. <laughs> okay. He good. wished me well as I left, and he meant it. Oh, that's good. That's very yeah. sweet. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Great. Yeah. It's good. Okie doke, let's see, uh, Vasu, okay? So I'm asking you to unmute, a specific question, yep. Hi, uh, thanks Rick, it's a very specific question. How is it that sometimes we are, e it's so easy for us to be compassionate to strangers? Oh, I saw uh, that, yeah. And uh, because like, you know, um, I mean taking, for example, I'm perfectly happy working in the hospice, helping people out on a volunteer basis, but at the same time, Let's say my mom is with me and she's 90 years old. Uh, I'm resentful of the time and attention and, you know, ongoing caregiving that I have to give. Whereas it's the same caregiving I'm giving there voluntarily if required. So where does this resentment come from and how does one develop uniform compassion? Ah, what a deep, beautiful question. It's sometimes people find the opposite. They find, and there's a lot of research, that it tends to be easier to give compassion to people we like and also approve of, and also consider to be innocent in their suffering. But to be compassionate toward people we don't like, uh, especially if we feel mistreated by them, or people that we are critical of, uh, maybe we, we feel they have fallen below a moral standard, or we consider them to be at fault in their own suffering, right? That tends to be harder to mobilize compassion as a general statement, I'm sure with many exceptions. So what I think the, the Buddha really emphasized, which is so interesting and kind of radical, uh, is the language of omitting none or the language of radiating loving kindness, compassion, 
happiness at the welfare of others in all directions without qualification, right? Now, that's something we develop over time. And where for me, the uh, to answer your question from a practical standpoint, um, it's to kind of work with what's just out of range. If it's way out of range, it's too far. We can't get to it. If it's already in range, we're able to do it. There's not much value in developing it further. But what's just out of range or kind of comes in and out of range, that's where we can practice a lot. So it may well be that you find that there are people who are close to you that um, are harder for you to have compassion for. So what you might start is bring to mind people that are easy to have compassion for, perhaps strangers, and then see if you could bring that uh, sense of compassion to people that maybe you know a little bit better stabilize the compassion there, and then potentially bring the compassion even closer and closer and closer. It may be that in the process of this, you will discover what's getting in your way. And it would not surprise me, and I can speak from personal experience, if what's getting in your way of, peop of having compassion for people that are closer to you is just the layers and layers and layers of reactions to them built up over the years. And sometimes you, we realize that we need to help those reactions clear out to be able to find compassion for that family member, that husband, that wife, that partner, that child, that parent, that brother, that sister, you know, the, the mother-in-law, the father-in-law. And I find bottom line, what has really helped me is to remind myself that compassion is a response to suffering. And suffering is suffering in whoever it, it is. It's still suffering. And even if I have a history with a particular person, if I just keep zeroing in on their unhappiness, their pain, their frustration, you know, their contraction, their neurotic preoccupations, if I just get out of my judgments about all that, and I just go right out, what's the suffering like? What's it like to be them? And to kind of open to it empathically, then there can be a natural compassionate response. Even if this is someone that um, I have layers <laughs> of reactions to, you know. Okay, I'll leave it there. All right, great. How about uh, one more person? So I see Samsonite, there we go, asking you to unmute. There you go. Um, All right. Can, can you, you can hear me? Yep, very good. Wow, a complete treat to be live with you here. Oh, great. Uh, my therapist gave me your book about five years ago and I've been on the path since. I got good. a question for you, so thank you. Thank you, man, thanks for showing up, yeah. So what do you do when the piece of the piece, the piece of that, the piece of stat is, is cranking, you're rocking, there's the radiating happening, you're feeling connected, magic's happening, and you're really just seeing things unfold. And, and there's that sense of equanimity you can really mm. kind of just feel into, wow, I don't really need to push or pull. Things are things are rocking. And then and then maybe some stress happens and you get I, you know, I find myself kind of like, you know, taken out of that. And then the compassion isn't as, as strong and the bravery kind of starts to diminish. How do you, and, and, and going to the meditation cushion, it's like there's, there's some resistance, there's a lot of resistance. How do you find yourself coming back? And like, what, what, do, you, what do you do to re-engage mm. and, be, and be kinder again? How, how to re-engage? That's sweet. Can I ask you, what do you do? Because clearly you have a lot of self-awareness and you've been practicing. What do you do? Um, I, I just I, I just keep trying. And um, just keep trying to reconnect. And I guess lately it's been like um, just challenging. And yeah. there's that I there's that that glimpse. There's a couple of those glimpses, there's those idealized. Yep. Maybe idealized glimpses. And then it's like, how do I get back to that? And then there's this, this like the craving almost. And yeah, I don't know what to do. 
Uh, yeah, um, I I have a hunch because it's worked for me that <clears throat> uh, counterintuitively, what's helpful actually is to go into the reactive upset. And it's understandable. We want to, sometimes stuff comes up and we just quickly disengage before it has a chance to take root. Great. But other times, <laughs> you know, <laughs> boom, it has sunk its roots in. And there it is. And the more you get mad at yourself, the more you try to disengage from it or push it away, the deeper it stinks in. Okay. And so the judo, the whatever, Aikido something or other move, uh, I find, especially as a guy who grew up, you know, trying to keep his feelings at bay, is to actually go into it and to let yourself really feel it and to actually really explore it. I mean, in some ways, this is sort of applied mindfulness 101, but it's to really, it, it's classic wisdom of therapy. You know, you just really go into it. And you've got to hold on to a little bit of calm, a little bit of observing to be able to go into it without being overwhelmed by it, but to actually go into it and to let it flow through and to, and to release it. And I honestly want to offer a little bit of a hunch here about you. I have a hunch that with your with your personal experience with practice, that you would be able to go into it while recognizing with insight the impersonality of the experience. It's happening impersonally, in a sense. So because you have insight, you can mean you can you can have that insight even as you're allowing it to really flow through. And after a while, it starts to deconstruct. It starts to open up, air out. And if it isn't opening up and airing out, where's the resistance? Look for the resistance to the full experiencing. And it may require a looking down into younger layers or subtler layers or more vulnerable, more intimate layers, but that are not yet um, allowing the full release but you're doing that. And, and two things here, very often what happens is on the other side of it is, is a piece. You know, it's like crying. And then after you finish crying, there's a piece. Or maybe you just really get mad about something. But then there's a kind of peacefulness, right? On the other side of it. And even, you know, with insight, you can start to realize that the upset is like a mosaic. The experience is like a mosaic or a picture with pixels. But between the elements, the compounded elements of the experience is a field of awareness that is completely peaceful all the while. And, um, and that, that recognition can deepen over time. So I'll maybe I'll just and I, then I think uh, maybe just one more thing real briefly is that alongside this practice of really just going into it and letting it flood through you, letting it have you, um, even a welcoming. I was talking with Galen uh, Ferguson one time, great. Tibetan Buddhist teacher, professor at Naropa, and asked him what his practice was a lot. And he was he was saying, I'm I'm writing a book on welcoming. <laughs> welcoming. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. It's all included. This too belongs, as Tara puts it, Tara Brock. This too belongs. That's equanimity with compassion, right there together. Hello. Hello, friend. Hello, anger. Hello, upset. Hello, numbing. Hello, addiction. Hello, uh, nasty, mean-spiritedness. <laughs> you know, hello, plaintive inner child longing for love. Hello, hello, hello. You too belong. You too belong. Right? There's both compassion and equanimity in that welcoming invitation. Uh, and then at some point, I do find it's really helpful to just whew, let it go. Uh, the mind is imperfectible, <laughs> in a sense. You, it's like trying to polish butter. You just, 
there's a limit to it. And at some point you just go, I've processed it a lot. And now I'm just simply going to go back to what's fundamentally peaceful. And, you know, and just go back to your foundational practices, breathing, mindfulness, you know. Um, I also find it's last, I find it's helpful to kind of come into relationship with deep teaching and deep teachers, listen to a teacher. Uh, I just finished reading a marvelous book, China Root, China Root, about the core of uh, Taoism and Zen and Chinese Buddhism, this deep, deep teaching about ultimate reality and, and resting in the sense of that. You know, I go back and I read some of the phrases or sentences I've underlined and poof. They, what, you know, brings you home. Tick that on. Brings you home. Whatever brings you home, right? Yeah. Um, I'm think. yeah, I'll finish with that. Did you want to finish up though? Why don't you finish? What do you think about all this? I mean, I love it. It's, it's a lovely, I appreciate you sharing all those things and <clears throat> I shall check out some of that, that book, China Root. Yeah. Deep stuff. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Thank great. You. Yeah. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. You bet. Definitely. Serious. Okay. So Mary Lynn, we're finishing up. Uh, I won't take a long time, but I'm asking you to unmute. You've been patient. Thanks for waiting here. You have to unmute yourself. And nice, succinct question, please. Oh, thank you. Um, my question was, oh, I better scroll back up. I can actually read it. Okay. Um, I think it's highlighted, which is useful. Um, I just basically wrote, what does one do when a longtime friend has cut you off completely over a, a misunderstanding? Is it best to move on um, or better to explain and express compassion and equanimity, even if one feels angry over the sudden painful rejection? Wow. So first, let's assume that you're actually able to communicate with them in some way. That it kind of seems implicit in what you're saying. Um, there are details about this. Sometimes it's helpful to let a little time pass. You know. On the other hand, if we let too much time pass, things that were more fluid can become turn into cement. Uh, I find that. Um, it, if your goal is to repair, what's often helpful is to uh, reach out with the part of the truth that is entirely generous and responsible and save for later, if at all, the communication of the part of the truth in which you felt wronged too, or you were startled by their willingness to just use the nuclear option for what seemed like a misunderstanding of some kind, like, whoa. Uh, you know, and then, you know, to try to get into communication with the person, I, I think, you know, that's really useful. And, and in the communication, um, again, depends on what your purposes are, but to really listen, to really, to not give them anything to react to without being dishonest or inauthentic. I think it's okay, you know, to edit out parts of our truth, we're not lying. We're just not going making them explicit. Uh, and then see what you can do with that other person. Ultimately, uh, some relationships really recover from a big misunderstanding and get stronger than ever. Because there's a, it's like it is said that where a bone breaks and then heals, it's actually stronger and where it re uh, Other times, you know, you're able to have a partial repair, but the relationship is one step more distant forever after, sometimes three steps more distant forever after. And other times you just, you realize that unfortunately, that's the end of the relationship. Uh, so I, may, I, yeah. may I say something? Yeah. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, so first of all, yes, I did leave it a little too long. Um, because I had a lot of turbulence in my life and I didn't want to mix everything in and then, you know, yeah. just do all the wrong things. I waited a little too long. Then when I, when I actually did communicate, I kind of blasted him um, and with a bit of guilt and a, like a lot of, a lot of finger pointing and wrongdoing, but also sort of, you know, sort of this, you know, righteous piece of saying, well, you know, 
please do the right thing and don't cut me off. And so then he actually cut me off further to, to really slam it down. So I've been just in shock and not knowing what to do. But I think I recognize what you're saying that the wrongdoing just obviously is not, you know, you, you got to attract honeys with B, not vinegar. So I think I did a bit of that, but I, you know, I've been just writing these letters and composing all these letters to him. It's like way too long. He'll never read it. So we'll see what happens. But the, the, some of the deeper root of all this, and maybe I could wait for another time to ask the question, but I'm just curious very quickly, have you ever heard of the term relational devastation? No. Okay. So it's something that was coined um, to me by a therapist and um, that I was told I have, I've had a chronic rejection all my life by just about everybody. Like it's mm. been relational devastation. Yeah. Um, and I've been, you know, this person was a sort of a hybrid therapist friend. And then he decided, no, I made a mistake. This should have never happened. I should have just been either a therapist or, you know, and I can't be your friend. That's what's happened. But so this is just hugely devastating for me. He, I saw him as a big brother. But yeah. The, I have complex PTSD with dissociative yeah. subtype. This is very serious stuff that I'm dealing with um, due to infancy abuse. Yeah. And so I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm just trying to heal, but it's like, I can't, like, it's just the flood of devastation relationally just won't stop. It won't stop. And I'm really suffering. Uh, I feel for you. And I, I appreciate your candor here. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, I guess I, if I could offer two things, you know, as we all finish here. All your, all your recordings, I'm just, you know, really absorbing the, the learnings. Thank you so much. I just want to say how much I admire your, your, your uh, intellect. <laughs> oh, thank you. You're kind. I appreciate it. Well, well, you, you set me up for my two suggestions, which I'll say briefly, because we're going to finish here. Um, the, the first is, uh, you know, in a field of, trauma and abuse and and disappointment with others i find one thing that's really helpful uh, is to keep kind of coming back to the experience of good within you like clearly just your kindness to me right here your your and the fact that you resonate with you appreciate value you 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 orient toward what is helpful, truthful, wise, beautiful, whatever. I don't mean about me particularly, but just in general. That's a that's a good and and your fundamental benevolence. Yeah, you wouldn't be so pissed off at this guy he and fired if you didn't have such a strong feeling of the of goodness, you know, and and there's a a, a caringness in you. Right. So recognizing that even if other people are disappointing or partial or they make mistakes and then they overcorrect as a way to kind of, you know, sort things out or whatever, um, know your own goodness. Whatever they do doesn't mean being narcissistic or arrogant. It means there's a kind of humility that actually comes through a healthy humility in recognizing our own goodness, because then we have less to prove. Right. That's one. Um, a second thing uh, might be to really appreciate relational abundance in milder, simpler, everyday relationships. Like just shooting the breeze with somebody at work or... Yeah, actually, yeah. Even just today at my massage therapist, the receptionist, I just, I really like just soaked up that three minutes of conversation. Exactly. And to keep worrying to its abundance, fertility. You know the 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 field is is fertile uh, of those milder uh, forms and stabilize there. You, we can establish. It's interesting to think about this. I'll finish. You know attachment theory. This is actually really useful. We may not yet be prepared to have secure attachment in high stakes relationships, like high stakes relationships when we're a kid with our primary caregivers. But, but we can establish secure attachment in milder or more moderate stakes relationships and learn about stabilizing secure attachment in those kinds of relationships as, as a way to heal some of our attachment wounds and to give us the sense of secure footing a secure base of operations, 
stability, predictability in these milder relationships that are not so, in, in which we're not so prone to want to pull for more. Because we understand that it's a fairly mild and moderate relationship, and we're not going to get disappointed in it because the stakes are not so high. So, oh, the uh, the people at your massage, the receptionist at the massage place, uh, a casual neighbor four doors down in your apartment building. Yeah, where it's light, where it's easy, and explore what's it like to feel secure in those kind of relationships, lower stakes relationships, as a way to heal uh, insecure attachment with high stakes relationships. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much. I really yeah, I can tell you're really much. bright. You're going to go forward here. Much. Yeah. Okay, good. Enjoy these two forms of practice because they're both good. Recognizing goodness in yourself and stabilizing secure relationships in lower stakes relationships. Stabilizing secure attachment in lower stakes relationships. All right.